Hey, and welcome to the bone stress injury module. This is the thing that I treat the most in the clinic. We're gonna go through some principles of bone, the fundamentals of treatment, and then what we can do to help reduce the risk of these happening in our healthy clients. One of the key principles of bone is that it's always changing. It's always getting stronger or weaker. This happens on a day-to-day -day basis. This happens across our whole lifespan, depending on the things that we do. We see that bone responds to loading or activity as well as unloading. And we see that bone health is multifactorial in nature. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. It's affected by all our different body systems. Now our bones are primarily composed of water, mineral, and type one collagen. This collagen and mineral composite allows our bones to be strong, but also resilient and ductile. And if we look at the microscopic level of bone, we see that our bones are structured based on need. So each bone is gonna be a little bit different than the next one. And this can depend on what it's having to deal with. Are we healing a fracture? Are we more concerned about growth and development or adapting to some specific loads? We have four main functions of bone. The first one is protection. If you think about your rib cage, it helps protect your internal organs. That's obviously very important. It also is the spot where our red blood cells are produced. So a super important component of our body is produced within our bones. Our bone helps provide some specific endocrine functions. Our bones also allow us to move. Our muscles turn into tendons and those tendons attach to bones. That tugging or contracting of a muscle happens because of our bony skeleton. One key principle to understand is that bone is never metabolically stable. It's always changing. Now this happens because of the relationship between our osteoblasts and our osteoclasts. These are two different bone cells that are present in our body. Our osteoblasts are our bone building cells. They help deposit bone and make it stronger. Our osteoclasts are bone absorbing cells, so they help break down bone. These two are constantly going back and forth throughout our life. We have two different types of bones in our body. We have cortical bone and cancellous or spongy bone. Our cortical bone exists along the outer edge of our long bones. Cortical bone is highly mineralized. That means it has a lot of mineral deposits into it, which allows it to be super, super strong. It has a low surface to volume ratio and it's completely encompassed inside a bone matrix. Cortical bone helps us deal with loads. Spongy bone is present at the end of our long bones and it's more internal in nature. It's much more meshy, it's not nearly as mineralized, and its job is to help with endocrine functions as well as transfer forces throughout our body. Our bone mass is a measure of bone density and this is largely determined by our genetics. Our bone mass will change across our lifespan. We see that we tend to have the strongest bones and our mass is the highest about seven years after our big growth spurt when we're kids. And this tends to be in our 20s to late 30s. That's when our bones are the strongest. Our bone peaks in its content or how much bone we have, and then it peaks in its mineralization. So those mineral deposits that help keep our bones strong. This is a really important topic because a 10% increase in your bone mass can delay the onset of osteoporosis by 13 years. And a 6.4% decrease in bone mass during childhood can give you a two times increase in developing a fracture as an adult. Loading, being active, is very good for our skeleton. Loading helps improve our bone mineral density, it helps improve our bone architecture, and it helps improve our bone's bending strength. Those three things are very, very important. And being active certainly has a lot of other positive effects on our body. Exercise can help maximize that bone accrual. When we load our bones, we load our bones with three different things. The first thing we do is muscle contraction. So our muscles, they attach to our bones, and when they tug on our bones, they provide a little bit of a stimulus for that bone to get stronger. Just like if you did a bunch of bicep curls in the gym, your biceps would probably get bigger. The second type of load that goes to our bones is a ground reaction force or impact. When our foot hits the ground when we're jumping, when our foot hits the ground when we're running, those impacts, those cause our bones to have to respond and get stronger. And then we're always dealing with the forces of gravity. So just being on earth is gonna help our bones get a little stronger. Now we see that bone adapts in a very specific manner. So if I'm loading my shoulder by throwing a baseball, this shoulder is going to get stronger. These bones are gonna get stronger 
This is not. Our bone adapts in a specific manner to the things that we are doing. And we see that unloading has negative effects on our bones. So when we go on bed rest, if we're non-weight bearing after a surgery, if we're really active and become sedentary, we see that our skeleton gets weaker because we're not providing it with the right stimulus to stay strong. Now bone responds best to a very specific type of loading. Our bones like high impacts, odd impacts, and variable impacts. It likes dynamic loading. Now this type of loading happens with multi-directional sports or ball sports, basketball, soccer, volleyball, things where we're having to run and jump, cut, and navigate an environment that we're not certain is going to be a certain way. That's very different from distance running. Being active when we're young is very, very important. The prepubertal skeleton likes aggressive exercise. We've seen that active kids will have 10 to 40% more bone mineral accrual than sedentary kids. Children gain as much bone around their big growth spurt as they'll lose in later life. And we see that when we implement things like plyometric programs into elementary schools, that kids tend to have stronger hips pelvises and spines. And we also see that when we do these things as a kid, that it tends to stay with us across our whole lifespan. So we really want to emphasize these type of activities in our teenage years. We see that in both males and females, each year of participating in a ball sport gives us a 13% decrease in their risk of a stress fracture. In females, this is if they have normal menstrual function. When we compare sports, we see that elite Soccer players have stronger skeletons than elite distance runners. Distance running isn't necessarily bad when you're a kid. It's certainly better than being sedentary. It's just that we want to make sure we have a little bit more variety in someone's program. When we look at runners between the ages of 13 and 17, we see that they don't accrue as much bone as kids that are participating in another sport. And there certainly are some cultural issues around distance running that we want to make sure we're addressing during those early years, whether that's a tendency to overtrain, whether that's some misconceptions around menstrual or hormonal health, whether that's a poor relationship with food or some misconceptions about nutrition, those are things that might play into this risk of not having as strong of bones as well. Now when we look across our life, we see that we have three different phases where we're going to be focusing on our bone health. During those early years, we want to make sure that we're accruing as much bone as possible. During our middle years, say between our 30s and 60s, we want to maintain that bone mass as much as we can. And in our later years, we want to make sure that we're minimizing the loss of bone. When we get older, we are going to lose some of our bone mass. We want to make sure that we're minimizing that as much as we can. And across all three of those different sections, one of the ways that we can do that is by being active and continuing to engage in those high impacts, odd impacts, and variable impact activities. A big reason why we focus on this is because of the risk of osteoporosis. Now osteoporosis is a significant condition that people tend to develop when they get into older age where their bones get weaker. And this can be a substantial impact on the healthcare system and it can certainly impact someone's quality of life. This is normally something that happens in older age, but I've seen kids in their teenage years that already have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Now this is a concerning thing that can happen in kids, but especially kids participating in distance sports. One of the best things we can do for this is to continue to engage in those activities across our life. So to optimize our long-term bone health, we wanna make sure that kids are participating in these high impact activities if they are running. We wanna make sure that we're emphasizing a proper relationship with food. We'll talk about that more later and that we're engaging with those things across an entire lifespan. Now sometimes, problems occur. That's why you're taking this course. That bone stress injury is what happens when the accrual of micro damage through these loading cycles is greater than our body's ability to remove that damage. Now these didn't happen in two different situations. The first thing is a fatigue fracture. This is when we have a bone that has a normal elastic response it's just overloaded. This is the runner that is healthy and has good bone health, but they just run too much. We can also have what's called an insufficiency fracture where the training is sensible, the things that we're doing are more sensible, but there's some underlying reasons for why that bone isn't able to deal with that stress as much, and then a bone stress injury develops. Both of these happen in endurance sports. The thing that we miss the most is insufficiency fractures. That stuff happens a whole lot more than we like to admit. Now when we zoom into bone loading and what happens, we see that when we load our bones, 
some strain happens. And this strain isn't necessarily problematic. If no damage occurs, we see normal strain related remodeling and we can go back and load our bones again. Over time, this is how our bones get stronger. But we also see that sometimes some damage will occur. Now when this damage relating remodeling happens and there's an imbalance, we see that that damage can accrue and we can develop a stress reaction, a stress fracture, and eventually a complete fracture. That's the normal progression of a bone stress injury. When we look at bone stress injuries, they're not all the same. We divide these into three different categories, high risk, medium risk, and low risk. High risk, they're high risk because they're more likely to develop more problems. They're not as likely to heal. There's a higher risk that we might need a surgery to repair them. And then when we get into the medium and lower risk categories, we see that that's not as much the case. Knowing and understanding what bones are high risk is really, really important. We don't wanna miss any bone stress injury, but we definitely don't wanna miss one at a high risk site. In examining bone stress injuries, there's two different categories of variables we think go into why someone gets one of these when they run. The first is factors modifying the loads to our bone. This is when we look at training, how much someone's running, what the intensity is that they're running at, what their progression is like over time. We see that runners that run more than 20 miles a week are at a much higher risk of a bone stress injury. Unfortunately, that's pretty much any runner that's training for anything. We see that runners that run year round are at a higher risk of developing a bone stress injury. It would be good to have some variety in what we're doing across our year. And we certainly see that there's an increased risk when we're building, when we're running more, when we're doing more. Those transition phases tend to be when we see these the most. We also have muscle factors. So our muscles help us deal with impact. And as we get tired, we see that they might not be working as much as they used to. We might be shifting our strategy from a more muscular landing to more of a bony shock attenuation. Having strong muscles that have good endurance, those are really important. We think running gait or how you run can be a factor in this type of stuff. There's been research showing that runners that hit the ground harder, that they have a higher ground reaction force, they have higher braking forces, they have higher vertical oscillation or more bounce than they run, we see that those runners might be at a higher risk of developing a bone stress injury. There's been some debate over the last few years as to how much of an impact this has because we've seen some studies that show, well, maybe this isn't the case. So with running form, we're not quite sure where that's at yet. We'll talk more about that in the running gait portion. And when we look at things like running surfaces, running shoes, and inserts, we see that they're pretty inconclusive. They might play a small factor in these, but they're probably a lot less important than we often emphasize. Now the second category of variables are the factors modifying our bone's ability to deal with load in general. This is when we look at things like genetics. What's your genetic makeup? That has a substantial impact on your bone health. What's your diet and nutrition like? What's your endocrine status or your hormonal levels? How physically active are you? Do you have any bone diseases? And certainly are you on any medic are you on any medications that might have a negative impact on bone like corticosteroids? Both of those categories are important. We tend to miss that second category. Now we have pretty strong evidence that the amount of bone we have and how it's structured has a significant impact on our risk of a bone stress injury. Having stronger bones that are able to deal with running puts us at a lower risk of getting one of these. Our skeleton adapts in a site-specific manner, and it adapts by putting more bone in that area and then mineralizing that bone or putting more mineral into that bone. A small increase in bone mass, about 10%, can give us a 107 times increase in fatigue resistance. That's a huge number. Small changes in bone mass can have significant impact on someone's risk for getting one of these. And we see that if we've been physically active for longer, if we've been doing these types of things, we tend to have a lower risk of developing one. When we look into this second category, we have to look at energy availability. Energy availability is how much energy we're taking in, how much energy we're expending, and then how that relates to our specific body. We see a higher risk of low energy availability amongst female runners because of the relationship between energy availability, bone health, and hormonal health. Even short time periods of low energy availability has a negative impact on our skeleton. 
Five days of low energy availability has shown to change our bone resorption markers and our bone turnover rates into the negative. If we're in that low energy availability state, we start to mobilize calcium from our bones and make them a little bit weaker because we're trying to find different resources. We talked about how sports that involve high impacts, odd impacts, and variable impacts tend to give a better stimulus to our skeleton. We just don't see this as much with repetitive sports like running or non-weight bearing sports like cycling and swimming. When we look at the bone mineral density of our femoral neck, we see that athletes that engage in those high impact activities tend to have stronger hip bones. And we've even seen that cyclists and swimmers can be seen to have similar bone mineral density to sedentary controls. When we look at collegiate swimmers, we see that they have lower total and site specific bone mineral density than gymnasts, soccer players, and volleyball players. And if we have this decreased bone mineral density in youth, we can't necessarily catch up for that in later life. So incorporating some of these other principles is really important. And if you're dealing with a patient, examining what those early years were like from an activity standpoint is vital to get an understanding of where they might be. Now, as we get into these topics, we start to see a pattern that emerges, and that's what's called the athlete triad. This used to be called the female athlete triad, but we now see that this pattern exists in males as well. And that's a relationship between our bone health, our hormonal health, and our energy availability. It's a syndrome of low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, osteoporosis, and menstrual irregularity or hormonal disruption. Female athletes participating in leanness sports like running, synchronized swimming, diving, and gymnastics are at a higher risk for developing this specific presentation. And over the last few years, we also see that this presentation exists in males as well. To examine this specific presentation, it's really helpful to use the Modified Female Athlete Triad Risk Assessment developed by Krauss and colleagues. This is a simple screening tool that goes through a few different sections and just asks people questions. And what you're looking for is if they have a pattern that might fit that athlete triad. Early intervention with these athletes is really important because we don't want this to progress to an eating disorder, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. Keeping people from getting to that point is really, really important. When we're dealing with low energy availability, we see that it can suppress our hormone function and that can have significant effects on our bone health and our risk for a bone stress injury. We have suppressed bone formation and we have increased bone resorption. Not only does the athlete triad increase your risk of having a bone stress injury, it decreases your performance. And there's a ton of other more substantial problems that we can have from renal issues, metabolic problems, neuropsychiatric disorders. There's a lot of other things that can come along with this. Making sure that we're educating our patients on the risks of these and assessing to see if someone might fit this pattern is really important. Whether you're a physical therapist, a chiropractor, or a coach, you might be the first person that noticed some of these tendencies. Now the diagnosis of the athlete triad can be challenging because there isn't a specific test for this. It's more of the presentation. Low energy availability in general can be hard to test for because many people will continue to compete and train without any pain present and still fit this category. Let's break down each component. Low energy availability isn't just about energy balance. Signs of low energy availability can be present with a lower BMI, but BMI is not always a helpful thing to use. And if we look at something like disordered eating, we see that that can be a significant risk factor for all running related injuries, not just bone stress injuries. The normal menstrual cycle runs from 21 days to 34 days. There's gonna be some variability for each person, so it's important to ask what is normal for this individual. We see that there's a 4.3 to six times increase in your risk of a bone stress injury if you have menstrual dysfunction. Now, if we have athletes that are outside the range of 20 to 45 days of their cycles, there's some other things that we might need to consider as well. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, thyroid disorders, hyperprolactinemia, and ovarian insufficiency. Those can all be things that could cause this as well. Amenorrhea is a significant risk factor for all running related injuries. So having an understanding of what's normal for an individual and what to do if something is not is really important. This is when it's important to have a really good team around you. If you're a PT or a chiropractor, this is kind of outside of your skill set. Making sure that you have a quality physician or dietitian 
engage these clients with is really, really important. Now we see a higher prevalence of low bone mineral density in endurance athletes. Now the diagnosis of osteoporosis in kids can be challenging. You need to have a clinically significant fracture to be diagnosed with osteoporosis. Adolescent runners with low bone mineral density have a five to six times increased risk of developing a running related injury. DEXA scans are the best thing that we have to look at our bone mineral density. These are really, really helpful in older age. It's a big machine that takes a picture and tells us how dense the bones around our hips and pelvis are. If we have a decrease in our bone mineral density, that can be due to a few different things. We could have a reduced normal bony tissue. So our tissue is normal, there's just less of it. We could have reduced tissue mineralization. So those mineral deposits, there's less of them making it less dense. Or our bone is expanded in diameter. So our bone structure has changed. That's part of the reason why DEXA scans can be challenging with kids because their geometry is changing. So just because you have someone that has a normal DEXA scan as a youth doesn't necessarily mean that bone mineral density couldn't be a component of their stress fracture. And that goes into some of the downsides of DEXA scans. DEXA scans aren't designed to examine geometry or architecture, which both have significant factors in someone's bone strength. DEXA scans can't differentiate between cancellous and cortical bone. And we can't look at something like bone mineralization without something invasive like a bone biopsy. So it doesn't tell us about mineralization. So what does all this mean? We currently don't have the tools as clinicians to completely know someone's bone situation. So it's important that we understand all the factors that go into that and then try our best to look at their specific situation. We look at their past sports history, we ask them relevant questions, and we make sure we have an understanding of these different variables when we go to engage with someone. When we have someone that's been diagnosed with the athlete triad, the recovery can be quite long we can get their energy status back relatively shortly. We can get their hormonal status back in potentially a few months. Their bone mineral density might lag for a few years and all this will be dependent on the individual. And over the last few years, we've learned that there's even more outside there besides just the triad. The athlete triad is a common presentation but even more can be going on with someone's bone health. And that's when we look at relative energy deficiency in sport. Impaired physiological functioning caused by relative energy deficiency and includes but is not limited to impairments of metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, and cardiovascular health. Relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS expands and looks at more factors that can be going into someone's bone health or the risk of stress fracture. So when we go to perform our subjective examination, there's a few key things we need to investigate. What's their past medical history? What's their past sporting history? What's their hormonal function like? What's their nutritional status like? What's their training history? And what's their general well-being? When we start that subjective examination, there's a few key things that bone stress injuries tend to present with. Bones tend to not warm up like tendons do. So when we're dealing with a tendinopathy, it's very common for someone to say that it warms up over time. We really don't see that with bone stress injuries. Normally, it becomes painful at a point with running, exercise, or a day-to-day -day task, and then they can no longer do that. And often, wherever, whatever they could do gets harder over time. So maybe someone can run for three miles before their foot starts hurting, and eventually it gets to the point where they can barely walk. We normally see a regression in their tolerance to those activities. When we look at some objective assessments, a lot of the stuff that we learn in school is not very helpful. Bone stress injuries tend to be more vague in nature than tendinopathy. With most tendinopathies, you're gonna report pain that's very specific to a tendon. Bone stress injuries can be a little bit more nebulous, and normally they're gonna to point to a region that doesn't have a tendon close to it. If someone is pointing to pain on the top of their foot, there's a good chance that that's the bone because there's not much tissue there besides their bones. If someone says the back of their heel hurts and they point directly to their Achilles tendon, there's a good chance that this is an Achilles tendinopathy they're dealing with. Things like tuning forks and ultrasound over a fracture site they're not helpful tests when it comes to diagnosing one of these in the clinic. I think it's important that with our examination, we should be focused on placing increased loads on the affected area. That can start with basic assessments like walking, standing on two feet, standing on one foot in a bodyweight squat, and eventually lead to more progressive things like a side plank, a front squat, plyometrics, 
and look to see what the response is like. When we look at diagnostics, we see that x-rays are not very helpful with these. Only about 10% of bone stress injuries will be picked up by an x-ray. So if someone comes in and they say, hey, I got an x-ray and it was negative, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not dealing with a bone stress injury. But we see that preventative imaging is not very helpful. In a study done on collegiate level runners, we found that 43% of a college team had the presentation of a tibial bone stress injury on imaging, but they didn't have pain. And then when they followed them for the next two years, they saw that none of those individuals went on to develop pain, even though they were still competing in the sport. Our bones are always changing. So if someone has pain over a bone, has an MRI that shows a stress reaction or a stress fracture over that site, you're probably dealing with a bone stress injury. MRI or CT scans are our gold standard for diagnosing these. You need to have the imaging, but you also have to have the clinical presentation. Now, as we examine those low risk bone stress injuries that I talked about, we see that those tend to happen more on the compressive sides of the bone. So the side of the bone that has to deal with more compressive or squeezing forces. Because of their nature, they tend to be more apt to heal from this injury. And that's normally based off of anatomical considerations and blood flow to the specific area. When we look at those high risk bone stress injuries, we see that they tend to happen more on the tensile side of the bone or the side that deals with more tension related forces. Unfortunately, these can often lead to surgery. We often need surgical fixation if we're dealing with an anterior tibial cortex stress fracture, a femoral neck stress fracture that's on the tensile side of the femoral neck, a fifth metatarsal stress fracture or a navicular stress fracture. And normally this intervention involves placing an internal fixation inside that bone. We classify our bone stress injuries based off of three different variables. Pain, it's grading on imaging and the location. When we look at expected times back to running, we see that that can range from eight weeks to 22 weeks back to running. Those time frames are always based on the individual. Higher grades of a bone stress injury on imaging tend to lead to longer time periods before they can return to run. And we see that bony remodeling in these sites is independent of time. You can't speed that process up. It's going to take about three months for that bone to completely turn over and repair itself. It's important to understand that a gradual return to run progression is not enough with one of these injuries. We want to improve the structural integrity and quality of that bony tissue and the entire body to optimize their ability to get back into running. This means we need to incorporate progressive weight bearing drills that load the fracture site good strength exercises, looking at heavier variations in squatting, deadlifting, lunges, and making sure that we have a good plyometric program in place. All of those things should be implemented before they start their return to run progression. And remember, as they start that return to run progression, the goal is to run and not have pain. It's not to improve fitness. Unfortunately, when people are diagnosed with one of these, it will take a while before they can get back to their full abilities. And it's important to talk about that and be mindful about how hard it can be to deal with that throughout the recovery process. Now, often there are time periods where we have to be non-weight bearing with these or modify our weight bearing. And we see that if we are non-weight bearing for a period of time, our bone density and our microarchitecture gets worse. This is often necessary to make sure that the fracture is healing, but we also have to understand that just because someone has pain and they haven't been active for a few weeks, doesn't mean they're in the same situation as before they had the injury. We've seen that in rat models, trabecular bone, if it's unloaded, it's going to respond in a time dependent manner. So if you have a longer period of non-weight bearing, you're probably going to have a further decrease in bone mineral density than if it was just a few days. During that recovery process, we wanna make sure that we're improving muscular strength and endurance. We wanna make sure that we're loading the side of fracture, but we're also loading the entire limb in the way that it has to act when we run. And that there's a very specific way that we can go about improving our bone integrity through our exercise prescription. We wanna make sure that we're incorporating those dynamic loads that we talked about, that we're making sure that we're keeping our dosage of exercise relatively low, and that we're applying that multiple times throughout the day. So if the standard kind of rehab program says, here's your 30 minutes of exercises that I want you to do three times a week, we're going to take that and chop it up. We're gonna have you do a few exercises that are really challenging a couple times a day. Mechanical loading is more effective at enhancing our bone mineral properties if it's dosed multiple times a day, 
with full recovery periods of about eight hours between sessions and that we're challenging the bones that we want to get stronger. And it's crucial throughout the process that we're progressing all these exercises over time. Runners are notorious for having their set of exercises that they do that they basically do for the rest of their life. Just like with training, that has to progress over time because our bones get bored with this stuff. They need a progression so they can remember that, hey, I have to get stronger. The loads that we place on our skeleton have to be greater than their habitual loads. So we need to look at what type of activities they are incorporating at the time when we start to work with them and make sure that we're having them do more challenging things over time. And throughout the whole process, we're taking into account someone's past medical history, the severity of their fracture, and their specific life situation. When we go to program exercise, we wanna make sure that we're incorporating some site-specific exercises, some running-specific movement patterns, and some general strength exercises. When we talk about site-specific exercise, we wanna remember the specific anatomy of the fracture site. If someone comes in with a femoral neck stress fracture, we have to make sure we're challenging the muscles around the femoral neck making sure that they can tolerate side planks, lunges with an offset load, and other exercises that load the outside of their hip are really important because that bone is gonna adapt in a site-specific manner. We also wanna make sure we're getting all their tissues ready for running, so making sure that they're doing some single leg exercises that progress them through the running positions is really important. And remember, we have to incorporate some heavy loads if we wanna make sure our bones are getting stronger. So taking someone through a good dose of heavy squatting and deadlifting throughout the recovery process should be beneficial from a bone mineral density standpoint. When we look at loading to improve bone health, I divide this into three different phases. The first phase, we're just looking at resuming ADLs or activities of daily living. This is making sure that someone can get back into their everyday life and incorporate a few exercises that load the target area. As they get used to that and we move into phase two, we're gonna start them on a fitness walking program. Walking is really important for bone stress injuries because the mechanics of walking are very similar to the mechanics of running. So it can be an easy transition from not running to running if we get them on a good walking program a few days a week. We're gonna to start to incorporate more global and site-specific exercises, introduce some heavier variations, and introduce plyometrics. And finally, in phase three, as we resume their running, we wanna make sure that we're continuing to incorporate those heavy lifts and plyometrics that we're making sure that that works well with their run progression. When an athlete starts their run progression, I will keep them running on an every other day basis for almost eight weeks and sometimes a little bit longer. That way they're running on one day and they can incorporate their drills and lifts on the, on the next day. This back and forth makes sure that we're allowing that recovery time period from running or lifting and making sure that we're not overloading them with too much too fast. When they start their run progression, they need to continue to progress their heavy lifting. That's an important thing that often gets left aside with runners. So the first question that a runner is gonna ask you when they have one of these is when can I run? Here are some of my non-negotiables for what they have to accomplish before we can run. We wanna make sure that we're loading the affected bone. We wanna make sure that we have progressed through a plyometric program of bilateral and unilateral jumping exercises. We wanna make sure that we've got them into a program of lifting with squatting and deadlifting. We want to make sure that any of the subjective concerns that have come up throughout the recovery process have been addressed and appropriately referred. This could be to a dietitian, this could be to an endocrinologist, this could be to a different physician. Any subjective concerns we have, we have to have plans in place before we start a return to run progression. If we don't do this stuff before they run, I feel like we've done a disservice to the individual. Just because someone starts running doesn't mean that's the end of the rehab process. A study by Pope and colleagues looked at what happens to our bone mineral density in the year following. What they found that there was a steep decrease in our bone mineral density throughout the first 12 weeks of that injury. And that over time, that slowly got back up to normal. And while a majority of the individuals in the study regained their normal bone mineral density, 33% of them did not have their normal bone mineral density at a year follow-up. Now that's problematic. We've already talked about how important bone mineral density is. If we know someone is now in a worse situation than they were before, they're at a risk of getting another one of these. Now within that year time frame, we saw that 10 of the 30 subjects had a subsequent bone stress injury. Eight of the individuals never regained their bone mineral density. We saw that six of them never returned to running and that one of the subjects had three bone stress injuries in a year time frame. That's not good. So we need to approach these injuries with a lot of seriousness because if we don't get all of this stuff addressed and have good plans in place from exercises and training and nutrition and overall health, 
then we're running the risk of this person not returning to running. And that's not what anybody wants. Now, as they return to running, there are some things that we might wanna look at from a form perspective. We highlighted this a little bit in the first section of this. We do see that a five to 10% increase in step rate may be beneficial from reducing their risk of getting another one of these. Now, step rate is dependent on a lot of different things. How long someone's legs are, their specific anatomy, there's lots of different things that go into that. But there's a chance that having them adopt a higher step rate, if they're maybe in the 160s and below, could be beneficial. When we look at their foot strike, we wanna see if they're overloading the area where the problem occurred. So if I have someone that has a metatarsal bone stress injury and they're a very aggressive forefoot striker, I might wanna see if we can get them to land with a little bit more of a full-footed stride to load that bone a little bit less. And I also wanna make sure that they have a little bit more cushioning under that spot. All of this is gonna be dependent on the individual. If I have someone that has a femoral neck bone stress injury and they have a large crossover gait where one foot goes over the next, I might wanna make sure that they aren't running on cambered roads a lot. So that load is being placed on the outside of the hip. We might wanna have them avoid the cambered roads and we might wanna have them pick up their step rate a little bit. It's always gonna be dependent on the individual. So when we look at risk reduction with this stuff, what are the things that we can do? Once someone is back to running or if someone has not had one of these, what can we do to reduce their risk of these getting these in the future? Sound training plans, are obviously very important. We wanna make sure that people are making sensible training decisions with relation to their life and making sure that that's changing throughout the year. So they're having some time where they're not running as much. They have some times where they're not racing as much. We also wanna make sure that they have some varied athletic exposure. Maybe that's incorporating a rec soccer league one day a week or doing something that's different from running to give their body a slight big from running and a different stimulus for improving their bone health. We want to make sure that they're incorporating some plyometrics into their program to make sure that we're incorporating those high loads on their body. We want to make sure that they're monitoring their overall situation and feeling good. And certainly we want to make sure that they have sound nutrition. Nutrition is something that we do a really poor job of educating on. Making sure that a runner can understand the principles of nutrition and the specifics of running with that is really, really important. So let's dive into a case study and show how this plays out in real time. Jessica is a 16 year old high school cross country runner who presents with insidious left groin pain with running activities. Symptoms have increased throughout the season and have begun affecting ADLs. Patient is consulted with a pediatrician who diagnosed her with a hip flexor strain. Radiograph was negative, but displayed cam morphology on her left femoral head and the diagnosis was changed to FAI. Patient has been off running this last week. Reports symptoms with all weight bearing activities, prolonged sitting, squatting, rolling over in bed, and ascending stairs. She denies pain at rest. Patient has her first menstrual cycle at 16 years old. Reports menstrual irregularity since then. Patient is a vegetarian and reports getting around 2,000 calories a day. What do you think? Take some time and look at this specific situation. Let's move into the objective examination and what happens when we take her through some simple tests. Postural assessment reveals that there's a right lateral lumbar shift and weight shift to the right foot in standing. There's decreased stance time on the left leg with ambulation. She has pain and apprehension with left hip passive range of motion at 90 degrees hip flexion, five degrees of hip extension, and five degrees of hip internal rotation. Positive scour tests on the left, positive Faber's test on the left, Single leg testing and gait assessment were deferred at this time due to symptom irritability. So our differential diagnosis is intraarticular hip pathology, hip tendinopathy, lumbar spine referral, bone stress injury. What do you think it is? For this case, we referred to a sports medicine physician for further follow-up. MRI revealed a 50% compressive femoral neck stress fracture. DEXA scans revealed normal bone mineral density throughout the lumbar spine and hip. All blood work was normal. So this ended up being a bone stress injury. And this is a common presentation that I see where someone has pain with weight bearing that's not localized to a tendon that gets worse with weight bearing activities. They'll also present with what I call pain with offloading. So specifically we see this with the hip and the pelvis where someone does something like a single leg stance, single leg squat, lateral step down, and the motion doesn't hurt, but when they go to come out of that motion and put weight onto the unaffected side, they get this response and pain and again, this is often at the hip or pelvis. That's something that you need to be on the lookout for. I have seen that many times in clinical practice and 99% of the time it's been a bone stress injury. And I've seen that whether that's at the level of the femur, the hip, the pelvis, the lumbar spine, watch out for that presentation. So what's our plan of care? Well, patient was prescribed bilateral axillary crutches and was non-weight bearing for four weeks. Once she progressed to weight bearing as tolerated, our objective